Good morning. Aloha. My name is Mark Shklov. I am the host of Law Across the Sea here at Think Tech Hawaii. Today, the title of my program is Before There Were Lawyers, There Were Warriors. Before there were lawyers, well, things weren't always settled in court. Disputes weren't always resolved with lawyers going back and forth and making arguments. Sometimes warriors would have to take over. And in the ancient days of Hawaii, warriors did settle a lot of disputes. And in a way, when you have to settle a dispute in that manner, it may help you determine what is really important, really important in life. Today my guests are Michael Medeiros and Manny Matos. Uh, Mike Medeiros is a senior engineer with the State Department of Transportation, Highways Division. Uh, he is a 1975 graduate of Kamehameha Schools, and he is a practitioner of Lua, Hawaiian martial arts, which is maybe the art form of the warrior. He's gonna tell us a little more about that. He belongs to the PA, or school, of Alohe Mitchell Eli. Manny Matos is a retired HPD officer who makes traditional Hawaiian weapons, often from endemic woods. He'll tell us a little bit about that and its connection with Lua. Many of the artwork that Manny makes are beautiful, but there's also a deadly aspect to them. So they're, they're, they're beautiful artwork used by lawyers, uh, lawyers, used by warriors, uh, should be used by lawyers maybe sometimes, but used by, used by warriors in the ancient days. Uh, so welcome, Michael, Manny, good, good to see you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. Good, good to have you Aloha. here. Aloha. Uh, Michael, I'd like to start with you and briefly tell us a little bit about Lua, what is Lua? Uh, you know, for those who haven't heard about it or know much about it or heard the name, t tell us more, please. Okay, uh, <clears throat> every indigenous race had some kind of martial arts, and Lua is the Hawaiian martial arts and the martial arts for the Hawaiians. In its most basic form, it comes down to uh, bone breaks, joint dislocations, and nerve strikes. Wow. Yeah, it's hand -to -hand, close quarter, hand-to-hand -hand fighting, emphasizing those three techniques. Okay. But and it... Uh, Encompasses more than that, so that's the basic part. But then also encompasses, you know, lifestyle and healing. And okay, so let me ask you: Was I right in saying it's uh, what Hawaiian Hawaiian warriors used uh, to to fight? Is that is that yeah, correct? Yeah, a lot of the fights, well, most of the fighting was all hand to hand, and Hawaiian uh, didn't have standing armies, but they had standing warriors, and that was the Lua Koa. People trained, and most of them were all of them were Ali'i, and then at times of war. The Lee would train the Makanda commoners in, in some simple basic things. And that's how they grew their armies to four, ten, ten thousand, whatever they needed. Okay. And with respect to uh, the relationship of, of a warrior in the ancient days to warriors today, <laughs> I, 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 maybe I'm drawing uh, kind of a, yeah. a, an impossible uh, connection, but warriors settled the disputes, right? Uh, there was war, yeah. It's, in fact, you would send, um, sometimes the armies wouldn't fight. They would send the champions, so your champion would fight their champion to set And if whoever won, that would settle the fight. The armies wouldn't fight. And there are, there are, we, have, we have lawyers in the pot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so, I mean, okay. so uh, Lua, what, 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 what is the history and background of Lua? And, and Tell us a little bit more about, about the techniques, please. Um, like I said, it's close quarter, hand-to-hand -hand, uh, fighting. So you do a lot of bone breaks, you're up close. The uh, leader was Olohe, which means uh, hairless at the time, and he, because he would um, shave all the hair off his body and all his body, there are times where so nobody could grab him. So they go to war, and, and if they were, uh, were all trained in the paw. They trained at night for secrecy. They didn't want, um, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, prepping for war or if you're hand in fighting, you don't want the other guy to know what you know. So they had I these see. big protocols. Okay. If you needed the password to get in, if you didn't have the password, the guard at the door would pull the string and this 500 pound rock would come down and crush you or he would just stab you right there. But you couldn't just come into the paw. Okay, so, so the secrecy 
I know you've explained that the, the secrecy behind the, the pa or or learning the lua was based upon the hope or, or the desire not to share some of the secret techniques of fighting. Right. Well, yeah. What you knew versus what you didn't want to go in there, and some of your opponent knew everything that you could do. Right. Right. Or you didn't know if you're planning war, your strategies that. Okay, now we know what they're going to attack. So you, that's what the secrecy was. So they would practice at night. And then Charles Kinn, who taught Oli Mitch, who, who I'm a student of, always said, "Huna na me huna." So you keep sacred what is uh, keep secret what is sacred. So that that's a big saying within the Paku. Char Charles Kinn. Kinn. Charles Kinn. Kinn. Charles Kinn. And who was Charles Kinn? So back in the '70s, so Dr. Olohi Mitch Eli, who I trained under. Th that's the the head of your school. Uh, head of our pa. school, Pa. Him and several, uh, just Jerry Walker. Jerry Walker, they, they, um, they're all martial artists at BYU. They used to be church college back then. And they saw Kalte magazine, and it had uh, a Hawaiian martial artist. And they said, did you know we had martial arts? He said, no, we kind of heard of it. And so they tracked down Charles Ken, who at first didn't want to train them. But after continuing pestering him, he finally related not to train them, but to teach them Hawaiian history, because he was uh, a renowned historian wine historian and cultural practitioner just knew about the culture. So that's what they did. So so at some time, what I'm hearing is that uh, Lua was sort of lost and that uh, Alohi Mitchell wanted to learn more about it yeah. along with a few others. How was it lost or what what it, what it, happened and then and then how did it get back? It was probably after uh, Post contact that there were the missionaries that there wasn't a need for it, you know, as it came into Western eyes because you had these guys trained solely in fighting. <clears throat> and so, like I said, so it kind of went underground and then it was lost, and people knew bits and pieces because as they were trying to research it before they found Charles, nobody seemed to have the whole story. And then when they found Charles, he was basically one of the last Lua masters. And he finally relented to teach them because he realized once he passed, it may not carry on. So. After, you know, four years, he started with 12, went down to six, and after four years, he graduated those six people. And, and, uh, Olohe. and th those became the teachers. Yeah. I see. Now, it, I just want to go back a little bit. In, in, in historical ancient times, uh, what, what was the role of the warrior? What, what was the role of the warrior and, and, and Lua? Well, Lua was the fighting. That's what they fought. You fought with the weapons. So when you went to war, all, all Hawaiians would, when they go to fight, they would they would well, use this technique. Okay, so or is the Lua Kaua were skilled in, in so see. the Lee were trained from from young age. I see. And that was one of the reasons Charles didn't want to train Aloha guys. He said they were too old. They were twenty seven. They usually train them when they're like five, six, seven years old. They start very young. So they, the warriors were trained in that time of war. They would grab the commoners and then teach them some basics. So, like I said, they didn't have a standing army. They didn't call. They couldn't call up an army anytime they wanted to. They had to go and train them. But there was people who were trained all the time, like Keiko Peel, that the gym at Kamehameha School. He was the guy that trained. Uh, he was Kamehameha of the Greats trainer. Oh, he was Kamehameha of the Greats all the way. So all he did was was war from a young age. He would train, trained in war, spear throwing, spear catching, using weapons, little manu. That, that's all he did. And and the the lua was used uh, in war, but was it also used in peace, or was it a, a technique that was used to to help make things ne negotiated instead of thought about? Uh, negotiated instead of fighting. You know that I don't know. I mean, I my recollection. I mean, I mean if you get two lua, lua guys. Sitting down, you know, if you had Kamehameha Great and Kai Kili looking at each other, and you know they're both great warriors, and, and you'd hope they would talk it out. And, and they, <laughs> they know each other's skills, and right. they know that they don't know everything about the other guy, so maybe they could they could work it out. Mm -hmm. That's what I what I was thinking might be a, a negotiable point is that if you have two strong people looking at each other, <laughs> may, may, maybe they're they're willing to talk about it instead of fighting. Oh, yeah. well, you know, one of the concepts of uh, and it was the original name is Kuyalua. He was one of the gods of uh, major gods of Lua, and, and part of that is to strike the second blow. So in Lua, you would never uh, be forward or be really aggressive, and so you, would, you wouldn't you would use it to go hurt people for no reason or just to be um, 
got grabbed, or you know, the local term, tantaran, you wouldn't do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Big, <laughs> you wouldn't you do wouldn't that. Make so big, big body big just body. for that. So you strike the second blow. That's what it is. So you use it to protect yourself, your family, your king, but you don't go all the way to hurt people. And I, and I, I mean, so the, you know, the thought that I that I had was that if in those days, if they knew that you were expert in lua, that would give them pause to to do something stupid. Oh yes, yes. You know, it would it would say, well, let's talk about it. Maybe that. So that, that that's where I was going and thinking maybe that that would be an avenue. Although it's, I mean, it's it's extremely tough fighting as I understand. So, what what happened after uh, Charles Ken and uh, taught taught these these old old youngsters? Older older youngsters. They're in their twenties. Yeah. yeah. So they graduated. So mm -hmm. it's Pakualua was their first uh, first school, and then that branched out to Pakualua and Pakualuholo. So there were two separate groups that came out of that. And then, um, so I, I'm a student of Dr. Louis Michilai, who heads Pakuiholo. And he has his training uh, at Kamehameha Schools. And every, we're on all islands. We're on Hawaii Island, Maui Island, uh, Kauai, and Oahu. And he's done training. The Aloha did training throughout all the islands uh, to bring um, seminars. And that's what, that's, what, that's what they do to this day. So we have our training coming up in July, uh, the, what we call the 48 hours. That allows you entry into the pod, so you can't do it now. You'd have to do the 48 first. So, 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 so the 48 is like an entrance exam. You were in, in, in a way, in a way, yeah. So oh, that's when you get you pass, and then you get brought into the pod. They want to find out a little bit about where, where you're coming from. Yeah. And, and what, what, what is uh, just to go back a, a, a little bit? So, what, what is the status now on on learning? Lua, uh, you know, it, it, as I understand, it was kind of lost until Charles Ken came along, mm -hmm. taught these younger guys or these old young guys uh, about it. And now, what is the status of, of Lua within the uh, community? In the community, just the people who've gone through that training, there's probably several thousand uh, people that practice actively. From we have people about 15 to 20 every Thursday practicing at Commitment Schools. Uh, summertime, it grows when the kids come back. Uh, kids from college when they come back in. So uh, our pod is, is uh, alive and well. And you, you still keep yeah. it secret, right? Uh, it's, it's for Hawaiians only. <laughs> you have to have named Hawaiian blood. Uh, we do practice at night. We wear black in you know, a okay. symbolized practice at night. We do practice at night. Uh, keep it secret. Keep it secret. Keep it secret, right? <laughs> uh, we, we don't talk about it. We don't want to, uh, Aloy, like Aloy Eli says, we don't do baby luau's. We don't do weddings. I mean, you don't it's see serious. a whole bunch. Yeah, you don't see it's us serious. doing a lot of demonstration. The stuff we do, we do the Memorial Day for the veterans. We open that. We've opened that every year for the last six years. We do serious things like that. But okay. yeah. Before we take our break, just tell me, what, what is the goal of, of the Lua today? What, what is the goal of... The, the pa and, and and teaching the lua. It's to raise um, Hawaiian people, men and women, because women are in the pa to to a higher, a higher level to better themselves, to feel better about themselves, to know that there's more in life that we can reach, or that we were once we were warriors, right? So we can reach out and and you know and to put raise your mana as we say and raise your self esteem, make you a better person in life. All, all those holistic things is all encompassed in Lua. And it makes you strong. Make it, you stronger. it makes you strong, and you know that you have this inside you. When somebody talks to you, you know you have this behind you. you you're a, strength you, and strong. You, yeah. you you don't have to. You can't fight, but you don't. You have don't to have fight. to. You're you know strong you enough don't, without you it. You can yeah. get up and walk away. Yeah, yeah, yeah but but, but you know enough. you but you know you're strong. Exactly. Enough. Yeah. Okay, I got it. Okay, we're gonna take a brief break and we'll come back and talk to Manny a little bit about uh, the beautiful Hawaiian artwork weapons. Yeah, I'm falling asleep over here. <laughs> <laughs> Aloha, my name is Raya Salter, and I am the host of Power Up Hawaii, which you can see live at from 1 to 1.30 every Tuesday at thinktechhawaii.com and then later on YouTube. I am an energy attorney, clean energy advocate, and community outreach specialist. And on Power Up Hawaii, we come together to talk about how can Hawaii walk towards a clean, renewable, and just energy future. To do that, we talk to stakeholders all over the spectrum, from clean energy technology folks to community groups to to politicians, to regulators, to the utility. So please join us Tuesdays at one o'clock for Power Up Hawaii. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a brighter day.
Okay, Manny Matos, <laughs> we're back, and don't let this scare you. This is some beautiful artwork that you cre created, and I'd like you to tell us a little bit about the connection between your uh, Hawaiian weapons that that you that you've made, uh -huh. and and the lua, what, and lua. Tell me, tell me what the connection is, how you how you got involved, and, and what, what does it mean? What, what what's it all about? Well, uh, basically, I got involved about 25 years ago by another. HPD officer who, who taught me basically how to make one single Leo Mano. Leo Mano uh, is these like, yeah these Native Hawaiian war weapons. And, uh, and it doesn't matter if you have one tooth or five teeth or ten teeth. Okay. So then I got fascinated by it and I started to do more research, more research, and the more research I more research I did, the more fascinated and. Uh, intrigued I got with it, you know, being my wife is a native Hawaiian and all my sons. And so uh, I started to uh, get access to core uh, wood for many years. I made them out of core. Then I, I was lucky enough to get access to native Hawaiian endemic wood like Kowila, Uhi, Uhi. So the deal in yes. What, what, what's the difference between koa, uhi, uhi, and koila? Tell, well, tell me, so what? Okay, well, uh, back in Kahiku times, uh, a Native Hawaiians would go to the dry land forests, because that's where all the really dense Native Hawaiian woods would grow, because uh, they were very special woods. They were endemic only to the Hawaiian Islands. Koa was kind of a wetland and was used for different purposes. But the Kawila Uhi Uhi uh, trees that grew in the dryland forest, to give you an example, uh, on Oahu, the Ever Plains, all the way up around Mukulaia, that was a demi uh, dryland. So these trees would grow in that environment on a big island, Puva, of the Wai uh, Waikoloa coast. What's the difference between the woods? Well, Koa, on one Koa hand. is 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 a is a medium dense wood, but when you get into Kawila and Uhi Uhi, it's very very. It's one of the hardest woods in the world. It's it, it's so dense that uh, it breaks my bandsaw blades. It sinks in salt water and. So it might make a difference if you're in hand to hand combat. Yeah, these these woods were very durable. They didn't break in combat very rarely, and uh, and they were so heavy that you didn't have to use too much force to. Uh, initiate the the cutting of flesh and, and uh, breaking of bones. So the Hawaiians discovered that and used those woods uh, as their as the preference? Well, yeah, the Native Hawaiians were very, very skilled in every aspect of their culture. They were they were the probably the most intelligent of all Polynesia. And uh, they discovered these woods when they first came here. Uh, and uh, they immediately realized these are the woods that we need to make our weapons of war. So they went through this dry land and just with a stone chisel mm. cut these trees down, carved it into these fantastic uh, weapons that uh, you see. And the, then they had the idea of the uh, shark's teeth. Uh, yeah, I guess, uh, huh? they were a Stone Age culture initially, you know. They didn't have any metal, they only had yeah. pohaku stone. And so they utilized the shark teeth, the, uh, the tiger shark teeth that you, have, you see mm. here. Uh, very large ones they would use, you know, mm -hmm. uh, maybe from inch and three up to inch and a half, maybe larger in those days. And they would use uh, the great white hmm. tooth. You know, there's, supple we there's uh, some weapons in the uh, museums in the world that have great white teeth on it, like this, this one here. This one uh, is, is a Hawaiian war weapon. It's in the Museum of Archaeology and Anthrographics. And uh, it has that, all great white. It's in Cambridge, England. Wow. This one, these are one of the few weapons that have the great white on it. And uh, of course, this one here is a sacrificial knife mm -hmm. with a great white. And the original is in New Zealand in the Old Man Collection. Oh wow! Yeah, all yeah. over the world. Yeah, it, it, you know, yeah, when the uh, so-called uh, first people came here, you know, from Europe and all over there. They were fascinated with this very primitive, you know, form of uh, weapons. Okay, so w what is the connection with lua? I, I mean, I, I, I understand the connection? You, you, you use them, but there seems to be a tighter connection too. Well, the, what I can uh, uh, learn is because it was a hand-to-hand -hand, uh, type of fighting and uh, they needed something besides their fists and uh, a piece of uh, wood, uh, never 
to inflict maximum amount of injury and death. And they, they've learned that the teeth on the shark could easily sever flesh and, you know, jugular veins. And, and it was a very brutal way of uh, defeating your enemy. But it did end the dispute, one way or the other, right? <laughs> they, they didn't need lawyers back in those days, you know what I mean? Uh, they, would, they would just be the old-fashioned way, you know, if you, you didn't uh, agree with his policy. and Because Lua was very different, you know, I, and maybe in my case. Lua created kingdoms. He created governments because you would conquer and right. you would create governments. Uh, so it was a different uh, way of uh, living. You know, and uh, you kind of incidentally, downstairs you have a big mural of a, a husband and wife, and she's kneeling and she's doing a hula pose, and here's a husband behind holding his ihi in a, a, a li'i coat. So you can see how they they really fed off one another. Lua as a as a as a Native Hawaiian practice, hula as a Native Hawaiian the, practice. The, the feminine and the masculine together in one society. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah. they benefited. Lua created kingdoms. I think Hula created and uh, perpetuated the genealogy aspect of it and the, the, uh, the uh, I would say, the entertainment part of it. Could you briefly just tell us what each of these are and the woods that they're made of so uh, we can get some idea of, of what, what we got here? Okay, this one I have here, this is uh, made out of Kawila, endemic Kawila. It's and, a uh, wood. That, yeah, it, right. it's, it's a very rare endangered endemic. It's, it's on the federal endangered species. Okay. And the teeth is tiger shark, huge tiger. It's about an yeah. inch and a half. Yeah. And uh, this one is an unusual design. There's only one in, in the museum, but that one has great white on it. I see. And uh, I think it, it was used more as a, or a symbol or maybe a sacrificial knife. Okay. This one here is definitely a sacrificial knife. Because you have a great white, mm. and it, it was close hand. And the original in uh, the Old Man Collection states it as a, as a sacrificial knife. So you know they did. This one here was used, I think, primarily for the older warriors. Like me. Yeah, like, you know, like us. Yeah, <laughs> you're still warriors. younger. Yeah, you're still younger. But this was used by the older warriors. They would come up behind the battle. And I didn't want to get too close to the enemy when it was lying on the ground. So they would have a larger weapon like this that was hollowed out because it wasn't as heavy. Because they all, oh. and they would lean over and sever the jugular vein. The brain, you know. is what yeah, they would. Yeah, yeah, they would do it. And uh, this one here is more of a weapon of of choice. That's heavy. You know, heavy. Yeah. And each each Lua uh, warrior. Yeah. Was obligated to go to the dryland forest, cut cut the tree down, and shape his own weapon and what he would prefer it to be, you know, and... Uh, so each Lua warrior was an artist also. Yeah, yeah, he, wow. was, he, he was an artist, he was, a, he, was a, he was a farmer, he was a fisherman, he was a bodyguard, he was, he, he incorporated all parts that, of That's really good, good to know because in his mind, in his, in the Lua mind, they, they know what they got. They know what's backing them up. They know everything. They know, just like Mike was saying, you know, when you sat down with somebody, you 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 knew you, you could get up and walk away, but you knew what you got. Yeah, you knew I, what you got in your hands and in your mind and your and what you created, right? A little warrior would always carry his leomano with him wherever okay. he goes. Maybe one or two. That's just like in modern day society, guys that can carry a weapon carry a weapon, so you know you're safe. And so if you're in the presence of a little warrior, you know you're safe because mm -hmm. the, these men and women would. Would, uh, would back you and, up. And because he made, he or she made, made the weapon, they knew its strength. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. Knew it, its it had their mana in it too. Okay. See? Ah, ah, it, ah, it, it, had, it had the spirit of who they it. were. Tell me about this one. This one here is, this one is a very rare, this is one of the most rarest of Hawaiian woods. It's called Uhi Uhi. Uh, I, I was lucky enough to get to uh, get a piece of log from the Puvalwa Forest about eight years ago, mm -hmm. and I was lucky to make this is one of them. This is uh, like I say, Uhi Uhi is the rarest. You don't see these trees. There's probably maybe ten trees growing in the true dryland forest, but we're propagating it. But at one time, envision Waikoloa, mm -hmm. the Ever Plains, you know, thousands of acres of these these trees that were growing. So we. Like the Lua, the dryland forests and some of these endemic trees are, are, 
they're not, we don't see as much of them around, although the lua looks like it's coming back. Yes. Okay? What are we going to do about the, the, these trees? What are we going to do, Manny, about, oh, about the, this? Fortunately, yeah, but unfortunately, these trees take hundreds of years to grow. You know, they're, they're very slow growing, you know, and uh, they can't grow in any other place but the environment that their genes are used to. Do. So, but we're slowly propagating it. And uh, so it's never going to become extinct. You know, we're slowly propagating. But, but before my time, is, I, I want to, you know, I'm one of the, I think the only non-Hawaiian that is allowed to go into Olohi Mitchell's pa every Thursday night. And I honor that because what it does is I sit there and I, and I look at all these men and women and I, I can see, I can go back to Kahiku time, I can see a little glimpse of Native Hawaiian culture that not too many people can see. And, and, and it, really, it really makes me more aware of a Native Hawaiians and how it, it's so important for them. And, and, you know, that, you know let, let's go back. And Mike, tell us how, if you're a young person is interested in getting involved in this, Lua, learning about the weapons. How, how do they go about doing that? And, is, and they, tell us about what's happening in July. Okay. We, we got a little bit of time left, so please. <laughs> we got, um, so we have our 48 coming in. So you have to go to what we call 48 hour training. Three weekends in July, the first week, first three weekends of July. And how do they find out about it? Um, they can uh, email me. Could you put my email up there? Or? Well, tell me what it is. What, my email? Yeah. Oh, mkmaderas4, the number 4, at gmail.com. And we have applications. Okay, great. That we can go and um, oh, email, if they email me, I'll send it to them. And once you go through that training, then you'll be you'll be brought into the Pakuholo. Pa and then you can come Thursday night at Kamehameha. Prior right. to that, if you can, only special <laughs> weapons oh, yes. makers are allowed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you have to be. You have to have some kind of native Hawaiian blood to be. A yeah, you have to be a native Hawaiian. Native yeah. Hawaiian blood. You have to be native Hawaiian. Yeah. So yeah. you know, I'm I'm so blessed to be allowed to uh, learn in the remaining years of my life to see uh, what, the, what what the culture was about. You know. yeah. Okay, and I think we can learn a lot about life from Lua and Hawaiian weapons. In a way, they they teach us to know about ourselves, don't they? they? They teach us to learn about ourselves and our strength and our weaknesses and use them as we deal with other people. And maybe lawyers can learn some of that and learn, learn how to uh, approach things and resolve them and only go into the fight when they need to uh, bring it to a... I think more importantly, it teaches you about your culture and, and, and who you are and, and where you came from. You know, that's your, your, your genealogy, your, 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 your aspect of who you, you really are as a native Hawaiian. I think that's what I get from watching these men and women in there. When they step into that pot, they are not anybody but native Hawaiians. And I think that's the most important lesson that I learned. Thank you. It you? brings us into balance, pono, we say. Yeah. Pono. Ku and hina. Yeah. You're talking about the two sides of duality. Yeah, yeah. Lua is two, yeah. ku and hina. So everybody yeah. tries to get pono, to get balanced. Yeah. Gentlemen, thank you for, thank you for having us here us about this and getting us, uh, you know, a little bit of information in the short time we had, and I appreciate it very much. Uh, mahalo for, for having us here. We really thank appreciate you. it. Take care. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. How are you all?